Well, today we're talking about grace. In this series this summer, we, we've hit some key doctrinal positions, some major foundational Bible teaching uh, about the Christian life. And uh, two weeks ago, we talked about grace, and we dug into the truth that the only hope we have are forgiveness of sin, having a relationship to God, and knowing that we'll spend eternity in heaven with the Lord is through the extravagant grace of God. Now, I want to read one of the great grace passages, and there are plenty of them. Read one of the great passages in the Bible. This from Ephesians chapter 2. The Apostle Paul, uh, he hits a high water mark when he writes in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. The Bible says we are saved by grace. The only way you're going to go to heaven is by grace. Grace is the doorway to heaven. You can't earn it. You can't work for it. You can't buy it. It's just by God's grace. If you could work for heaven, this is what Paul says in Ephesians 2. If you could work for heaven, what a miserable place it would be because all you'd be doing is hearing everybody's resume of how they got there. Let me tell you what a great guy I am. Let me tell you all the great things I've done. But it's not by what we've done. It's not by works, lest any man should boast. It is all by grace. We are saved by grace. The Bible says we're also forgiven by grace. Isaiah 43, the word of the Lord is... I, yes, I alone will blot out your sins for my own sake and never think of them again. For his own sake, not because we deserve it, not because we earned it, but for his glory he forgives. The Bible says we're sustained by grace. Philippians 2.13 says, For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. God's never going to ask you to do something. He doesn't give you the power and the ability to do. And that power and ability is the demonstration, the gift of God's grace. The Bible says you're healed by grace. God heals bodies by grace. He heals the wounds of your life by grace. He heals the hurts of your life by grace. The Bible says you're liberated by grace. You don't live under under a stack of rules and regulations and legalism. But it's all by grace. The Bible says we're given talents by grace, abilities by grace. That God's given each of us the ability to do something really, really well. And we're to use that for Him and for His glory. In Romans 12, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 4, break out some of that giftedness, the talents of grace. We're kept saved by grace. This is really important. You cannot lose your salvation. You know why? Because it's a gift from God. It's, if, if you earned it, if you worked for it, then the minute you stop working and stop trying to earn it, it could certainly go away. But it's not based on what you do. The Bible says based on what Jesus did. And your security in your relationship to God is not based on you paddling faster and faster to try to keep yourself afloat in your relationship to God. It's based on what Jesus did at the cross, and that is finished work. You are secure in your faith in Christ because it's based on grace. We're transformed by grace. Again, in Romans, by the renewing of your mind, we are transformed. We are becoming more like Christ by grace. We mature by grace. First, uh, Second Peter 3 says... Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You grow As you grow in grace, you're going to grow more like Jesus. You're going to become more spiritually mature. That's what being a disciple is, becoming like Jesus. And it is the gift of God's grace. Here's the bottom line. It's all about grace. Everything is about grace. Everything that God does in you, everything that God does for you, Everything that God does through you, it is the gift of God's grace. He empowers it. He carries it forward to His glory. Robert Louis Stevenson wrote, There is really nothing but God's grace. We walk upon it. We breathe it. We live it. And we die by it. And it makes the nails and axles of the universe. I want to show a a video to you. For those of you who are keeping score, it's two minutes and six seconds. But it is just a nice... A nice presentation, a good visual. We think about God's work in us. Let's watch. I am seeking. 
searching for the things this world has rejected. The things that are broken, that are flawed, thrown away and discarded. I seek the lost, the damaged, the forgotten things, the overlooked and the neglected. The things that have been pushed aside and left behind. Why? Why do I do this? Why chase after that which is despised by so many? It is because I have chosen the rejected. I bring restoration to the broken. I see beyond the flaws and the imperfections and I bring new life to the lost. This world has called them useless and garbage, hopeless and unwanted. They have been scarred, abused, ignored and unloved, but I, I have reclaimed them and they belong to me now. They are my masterpiece, and I have a plan and a future for every single one. For I am crafting these dissonant and discarded pieces into something beautiful. in Christ. He's a new creation. The old has passed away and the new has come. And he takes us where he finds us and he makes all things new and beautiful and whole. But think about this. Wouldn't it be a tragedy if you never opened up your life to, the, to receiving the amazing grace of God? How, how do you get this? Now we spent two weeks ago, we spent the whole hour on this. How do you get this? It sounds like such a good deal, people say. Yeah, I'd love to be saved, forgiven, sustained, healed, liberated, given talents, used, kept saved, transformed, mature. But how, how do I get it? How do I receive the grace of God? And, and, it, and God makes it so simple. By trusting in Jesus. By trusting Jesus. By putting all your faith in Him and Him alone as the only way. It's offered by grace. We accept it by a simple step. Trusting, putting our faith in Jesus. God didn't make this hard. It's not... 23 steps and four pathways and eight guide roads and 32 rituals and boxes to check. He says, by trusting in Christ. And it's just that simple. I'm going to put my faith in him. The Bible says, the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. All of, all of grace is wrapped up in a person. All of grace is wrapped up in the person of Jesus Christ. And he's the source. Grace and truth comes through Jesus. And there is no other way. And this is really important. There is no other way. Jesus isn't one of the ways. It's not Jesus plus Jesus or Jesus and. It is Christ and Christ alone. He is the only way to have forgiveness of sin, relationship to God, and eternal life in heaven. You don't, you don't have to get grace through religion. And a lot of people are working really hard to do this themselves. That I'm going to do some ritual. I'm going to do some religious stuff. I'm going to be baptized or take communion or uh, confirmation classes or some kind of membership class. You don't get grace through rules and religion. You get grace through a relationship. And that relationship is the one with Jesus Christ. So now, God's word says in Romans 5, so now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because, of our, Lord Jesus, because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. It's that idea of being reconciled to God. Because this is that, that sin separates us from God. And we can't build our own bridge between, between ourselves and God. And Jesus came to reconcile us to God, to bring us together again, to, to establish a relationship with God. And, and, and I love the wording uh, in uh, that uh, New Living Translation. It is friends in high places, right? I'm a friend of God. 
That's what it means to have a relationship through, to God through Jesus Christ. You are a friend of God. And he is close and he loves you and he's going to care for you and be with you whatever you face in life. And he says that's how you get the grace to live. Grace is free. And all you have to do is accept it. It is free to you. And I, and I want to emphasize this part. It is not cheap. And don't cheapen grace. Don't, don't, don't minimize what Jesus did at the cross. Oh yeah, I believe what Jesus did. He died on the cross for my sins. Yeah, I've heard that my whole life. Anyway, I'm going to go on living the way I've always lived. And, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to go to heaven when I die. Okay, some kind of cheapening of grace takes place in that kind of conversation. And, and what we want to remember is this cost Jesus his life. Jesus died at the cross to pay for our sin. And we're not to forget that sacrifice. You, you can't you can't shelve the, the, the extreme level of sacrifice, what took place at the cross. And so, God didn't want us to forget. And so he gave us a couple things to help us remember. One of those is baptism, believer's baptism. That's when we celebrate baptism today uh, between services. Because it's a reminder to us of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ. Uh, also, today we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper, uh, Communion. And the Lord's Supper reminds us of Jesus' body and Jesus' blood and the sacrifice of the cross. Jesus made this sacrifice for us that our sin could be forgiven as an act of grace. When Jesus died on the cross, there are at least three things that took place. And I want to touch on this before we move into, into our focus on the Lord's Supper. When Jesus died on the cross, he paid the penalty for our sin. Do you have, is that in your outline? I can't remember. It's been too long since. Okay, well, you need to write that down, right? He paid the penalty for our sin. That means my penalty for sin has already been paid. Your penalty for sin has already been paid. And one day you're going to stand before God. And God's going to say, you know you shouldn't be in heaven. You know you don't deserve this. You know you have failed, faltered, sinned, broken my law. So there's got to be payment for that sin. And you can pay for it, or somebody else can pay for it, but there's got to be payment. Now, you can pay for your sin. Here's the, here's the price. You, you spend eternity in hell separated from God. That's how you can pay for your sin, eternity in hell. Now, I know a lot of people don't want to think about hell, uh, talk about hell, uh, next Sunday, because it is a foundational doctrine of Scripture, we're going to talk about the doctrine of hell. I recognize it's hard to scare people in Texas talking about hell in August. <laughs> but I'm telling you, next week you're going to feel differently about that. Uh, I would love to get to that level next week, where kind of like Jonathan Edwards, where uh, he preached that sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, and they said... Uh, People were holding on, lashing themselves to their pews lest they fall into the pits of hell. Well, bring something to lash yourself with next week because uh, we're going to talk about that. You know why hell is such a big deal? Because it's the first doctrine to fall when you start denying the scriptures. That's the first one people give up. And a lot of, a lot of people who claim in, claim in Christ say, no, don't believe in hell. And then, no, don't believe in the virgin birth. No, don't believe... Don't believe in miracles. Don't believe in the authority of Scripture, ultimately. I think everybody's going to heaven. I think everything's good. I think I can live life any way I want to, and it's all going to work out. Hell's the first one to drop, and that's why it's a big deal that we establish uh, that particular doctrine. So you can pay for your own. You can pay for your own, the Bible says. You can spend eternity in hell separated from God. Or, or you can recognize the gift of grace that Jesus has paid for your sin. You only need to accept this gift. Second thing, he paid the penalty of sin. He broke the power of sin. That means Jesus gives you power to change. I hear people sometimes say, well, I can't change. This is the way I am. This is how, this is how I do things. This, this is, I, I'm stuck. This, this particular sin, this particular shortcoming, it just has a hold of me and I just can't break free. When Jesus died on the cross, he broke the power of sin and and you can put aside your hurts and your habits and your hang-ups 
And you can be set free because of what Jesus did at the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, the presence of sin will be obliterated. And we talked about that a couple of weeks ago in more length. But you know, one day, you're going to go to heaven. Because it, by grace, freely offered, accepted. By faith, trusting in Jesus and Him alone is the only way to have our sin forgiven. You're going to spend eternity in heaven. And in heaven, sin is no more. And all the junk and all the debris and all the mess that it brings to our lives. And that's guaranteed. Now, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper today. And when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, there's some questions that people sometimes have. Sometimes people say, how should I feel when I'm, cel- when I'm, when I'm observing the Lord's Supper? I'm, we're going we're gonna to do the, we do different formats. Sometimes we serve, in the, serve you in your pews. Sometimes we ask you to come forward. And this is a come forward to the back, to the front. But the, ta- the balcony tables are set up. And we get, ask you to do something. You're going to get up and you're going to go to a table. How, okay, so you go up here. There's a piece of bread and there's a cup. The body and the blood of Christ, it reminds us of everything Jesus did for us at the cross. He's, how should I feel? Should I feel guilty? Should, should I come up here? And uh, uh, we, have, we have a dog in our house who thinks she owns our house. And she, she's under the impression right now that it's just too hot to go outside. So she takes care of things inside because that makes sense to her. And uh, her name is Audrey. We didn't name her. We inherited her with that name. And I, and I find what has happened, and I say, Audrey. And she bows up, and she tucks her tail in, and she's so, so very guilty. Until Rhonda comes in, then she knows she's got to get a jail free card. She can do whatever she wants to, because <laughs> they have some kind of alliance against me. But is that how you should approach the Lord's Supper table? Oh, I'm so guilty. I feel so bad. I've done so many bad things. No. Uh, The Lord's Supper is not to make you feel guilty. It's to remember that Jesus has already paid for all of our wrongs. There's a whole lot to celebrate when you approach the table. You don't have to feel guilty anymore. Not Not because of you. Not because of me. Because of grace. Should you feel grief? Some people think so. Maybe I should come up here and I should think, Oh, man, I think about what Jesus did for me. And I do think about that every time I take the Lord's Supper. I remember Jesus suffered and died on the cross. His blood shed, his body beaten to pay for my sin. The sinless Son of God dying on a cross to pay for my sin. Should, should I feel grief like you're going to a funeral? Something sad? Jesus died on the cross? No, I don't think so. See, back here behind me on this stained glass window, you see the cross? Do you notice anything about it? There's no Jesus on it, I'll tell you that. I wouldn't give you two cents for a cross with a Jesus still hanging on it. Because Jesus I serve is alive and well. He is risen, victorious over sin, death, and hell. And that empty cross is reason for celebration. I serve a living Savior. He is in the world today, the old song says. He didn't stay dead. And so, I certainly don't grieve when I celebrate the Lord's Supper. No, no. So what should your attitude be when you, when you take communion, Lord's Supper? And uh, my encouragement to you is it should be a heart of gratitude. That you should be grateful for what God has done. And these two elements, as you take these things, I think, how could God love me that much? Me, I know me. How could God love me that much? Well, that he would do something so extravagant in a demonstration of his love. The Bible tells us how much He loves us. By this we know love, that He laid down His life for us. And we should be grateful. The Lord's Supper is a symbol. Nothing magical about the bread and the cup. It's a symbol. Uh, It reminds us, though, of some eternal things. Now, the Lord's Supper is not for everyone. It is for believers. That means those who have said, by grace, God's offered it. By faith, I put all my trust in Jesus and Him alone as my Savior. I've accepted this. It's for believers, for trusters in what Jesus did at the cross as the one and only Savior. Now, I'll tell you this. This is just a... I I talked to the, the folks being baptized today. I told them, this is a great day. A great day for other people. Maybe, maybe them being baptized would encourage somebody else to give their life to Jesus. Today's a great day to say, okay, God put me here. 
I recognize what Jesus has done, but I haven't ever acted on it by faith, putting all my trust, all my faith, my life given over to him. And today I'm going to do that. I'm just going to say, God, I have sinned and, and I can't save myself. I'm trusting Jesus as my Savior. And I want to follow him with the rest of my life. Uh, not, just, not just a little of me. But he's going to have all of me. And today you can give your life to Jesus Christ. Uh, so simple. Your heart, God's heart's already, already inclined toward you to say yes to Jesus. In light of what Christ has done for us, what should be our response? Second Corinthians, Paul said, And working together with him, we also urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. So because of all Jesus has done for me, what do I owe to Jesus? I owe him the rest of my life. I owe him my best. My, my past, my present, my future, every, everything in gratitude, not, not out of a sense of dull obligation. Do I go to church? Do I serve? Do I, do I lean into this relationship to God? But because of all he's done for me and is doing for me. So three different areas of gratitude, ways to express your gratitude for God's grace today. Here's the first one. I can express my gratitude for grace by making my life count. By making my life count. Again, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians, For you were bought with a price. I mean, the price, Jesus dying on the cross. You were bought with a price. So glorify, your God, glorify God in your body. And when he says body, the, the word that is translated body here for us isn't referring to this physical shell I happen to live in. But the body, as Paul uses it, refers to the totality of your being. It's, it's all you are and all you got. It, that's your body, and that body is dedicated to Him, your totality. You can't understand the grace of God and just keep on living the same way you've been living and making the same choices you've been making with or without Christ. You can't understand the grace of God and keep on ignoring His commands. You can't keep on wasting your time on trivial things and spending money any way you think you should... Spend money, you can't do that anymore because you were bought with a price. And a whole lot of your life needs to be oriented not to save you, but it is the evidence that you are saved. Something's going to change. Some things are going to go away and some new things are going to come in. But that's what happens when you belong to Jesus Christ. You change. You make your life count. I read a, I read a book, I was on vacation a uh, week before last, uh, the Five Presidents is a fascinating book written by a Secret Service agent, uh, Clint Hill, who served with five different presidents. And uh, He did not serve with President Reagan. Uh, he served with Ford. It was his last president. But President Reagan, and I thought about this uh, in relationship to a Secret Service agent, after the failed assassination attempt on President Reagan, this is what Reagan said, I have a new sense that I was spared for a purpose and that my time belonged to God after that. Because of the cross, just know this, you were spared for a purpose. Uh, God did this for a reason. Jesus didn't die on the cross for you to go on living just any old, old way you want to. He made you for His for His plan, for His purpose, for His will. He created you, redeemed you, for, for a clear plan for your life. He died for you for that purpose. And he wants you to fulfill it. In Peter, 1 Peter, uh, our old friend Peter says, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. God's grace. God's given you talents and abilities and opportunities. He's given you education and freedom and relationships and all these things that bless your life. But they weren't given just so you could say, well, I can use this to make a lot of money. I can use this to become famous or successful or... No, he used those things, that grace in its various forms that you might serve him and serve others in his name. He's shown you that grace for a reason. Don't waste your life. Jesus didn't die on the cross for your sins so that you would waste this life bought at such a precious price. Make your life count for Him. I can express my gratitude for grace by being generous. 
Uh, what was Christ like? Well, he was a giver. How about that? For God so loved the world that he, he gave. God's the great giver. Jesus was a giver. You're never going to become like Jesus until you learn to be like Jesus. And Jesus was a giver. He loved. He served. He gave. Until you learn to be generous with your time, generous with your talents, generous with your money, your resources, your opportunities, you're just never going to become like Jesus. And as long as we're in the, the default mode of our lives is selfishness. We're, we're going we're gonna to always turn inward, always going to want to hang on to everything. But, but to be like Christ is to turn outward, to be generous to other people and generous to God. So here's the question I want to ask. A lot of people say, oh, yeah, I trust Jesus that he died on the cross to pay for my sin, and I am banking my whole eternity on what he did at the cross. But I really can't trust him with my calendar, and I can't trust him with my bank account. Because, you know, I mean, he asked me for a lot of stuff in those areas about being generous, but I can't do that because I don't trust him for that stuff. Man, if you can't trust him for that, then we, the Bible's going to put serious questions on your trusting him as Savior. Doesn't mean you're not saved, but it means there's a diagnostic issue that has arisen that you better go get checked out. So the, the Christian life is going to show up in tangible ways, in tangible places. The Bible says in Romans 8, 32, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? And that's pretty logical. The fact is, I can say I love God. I can sing about how much I trust God. I'm going to put him first. But things like your money and your time, where you're investing your abilities show uh, maybe it's different than what you're declaring. God wants me to become generous like Him, and He wants my life to count. And those are ways to show gratitude to God. Third thing, I can express my gratitude for grace by sharing the good news of grace. This is uh, Paul's testimony in the book of Acts. But my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned to me by the Lord Jesus. The work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. It, you know, it doesn't say the most important thing in my life is that I hope that one of these days I get married. Or the most wonderful thing in my life is that my retirement is all paid up and, and set up and I can, I can quit work and do what I want to or I can travel or I can have fun or I can become famous. It says the most important thing in your life is to fulfill your mission. And Christ died on the cross for you. So, so wouldn't you want to tell somebody if your eternity has been changed by Jesus Christ, wouldn't you want to tell somebody that news? And if, if you get a, a free chicken biscuit at Chick-fil-A, you tell people about that. Could you not tell somebody about the eternal life through Jesus Christ? Somebody's going to want to hear that story. So tell good news to somebody else and fulfill your mission. Otherwise, it's an eternal waste. Now, part, part of that mission, not all, is to tell other people. The good news of grace. That God put you on the earth for that purpose. He has a mission for you that only you can fulfill. And once you step across this line of faith, put my trust in Jesus, by grace, I step across the line by faith. Then a part of this is to say, I want to invite other people to experience this too. If, but if it's real for you, you're going to want to tell somebody else about it. And, and they need to hear about it. Jesus died for every single person here in North Texas and just uh, all around the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. But, but this morning, uh, your typical resident of Collin County, it's not that uh, for a lot of them that they've rejected this story of Jesus and grace and faith. It's that they really have never heard it. And, and that's amazing that here in this country, where it seems so available, that could be true, but I'm becoming more and more convinced. It's just, they've just never had somebody tell them. Somebody who cared about them, somebody maybe they already knew and had a relationship with, to tell them, this is how you can give your life to Jesus. Some, somebody cared enough to tell me this story, and, and I wouldn't know it unless somebody told me, and there's somebody you need to tell. Now, if... Uh, if that person 
lives and dies without ever knowing that their sins could be forgiven, that there's a place prepared in heaven for them, there's a purpose in living, then for that person, you think about this Christ and everything that he did, that extreme love and grace of the cross, it's wasted in that case because they never heard. And the Bible says in Second Peter, the Lord is not willing that any should perish. The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, I like to give you those lessons about Greek words. You know what the word uh, translated all means in the Greek language, literally? I mean, it means all. Most of those Greek words just mean what they, what they mean. It means all. Not some, not this one, or not that one. It means all. That wishes that all should come to repentance. And that's his desire. God wants everybody in his family. Everybody needs Jesus. And because God cares, we have to care about that. One of the greatest ways to show your gratitude for what Jesus has done for you is to tell somebody else about the grace of God. You think about this. Is anybody going to be in heaven because, of, because you told them? Because you shared? Because you encouraged? Because you prayed? Because you reached out? Because you're willing to walk across a room or walk across the street in your neighborhood? Is anybody going to be in heaven because of you? So when we approach these tables, we do so with a lot of gratitude. Gratitude demonstrated in some key ways. Now here's, here's what's going to happen. In a moment, uh, we'll have uh, our, some of our deacons will be standing at these tables. They're, they're not here to, to hand you the bread and the cup. They're, they're here to pray for you. And uh, it's a big part of what they do in their ministry is a ministry of prayer and They're available. Some of you have needs in your life. You have family needs, physical needs, job needs. and A lot of people, I've found, have never had anybody pray out loud for the needs of their lives. You know, you say, hey, I'll pray for you. That's the best you get. Sending up thoughts, whatever that means for you. These guys are here to pray for you. Pray out loud for you for the needs of your life. And it's a big deal. And they're they're not going to do it unless you ask them. But they're here hoping you'll ask. And they're praying for you, just our church as a whole, uh, as you move around uh, silently. But they're here to pray for you. A lot of people took advantage of that at the first hour. And I hope that you will too. Uh, There's a spiritual preparation time that's going to take place. There are going to be some things that are going to be on the screens. There's going to be some music playing. Some things to encourage you in your spiritual preparation. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians, you should examine yourself before taking the Lord's Supper. Because you don't do this flippantly. Like... uh, and when you do that, like, oh, you know, yeah, I've done this before. I've been in church a long time, so I'm going to come take the Lord's Supper. But I'm not really going to worry about it, think about it, uh, look at my heart before God. The Bible says that there's some judgment that comes from God. That's, that's, not, a, that's not something to take lightly. So you need to spiritually prepare. Have you given your life to Christ? If you've not given your life to Christ, I'm going to be right over here. And I would love to, I'll share that with you. That's my purpose for being down front. Deacons are here to pray for you and other things, and they can talk to you about that too, but that's specifically my thing. You want to give your life to Jesus today? You want somebody to pray with you through that, talk with you about that? I'm available today. You can give your life to Jesus. Uh, some of us have just been a Christian a long time, but maybe it, you have been adrift in some areas. Or some things aren't where they should be in your relationship to Christ. And you need to get some things realigned with the Lord. and Maybe you spend some time praying about that before you take the Lord's Supper. So we prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper. If you're a guest today and you have given your life to Christ, we welcome you to participate with us. As a family of believers, uh, we welcome you to be a part of that today as a part of our family uh, here at First Baptist Church Allen. Uh, When you're ready, you'll just get up. There's no single file when other people in my row get up. It's whenever God, you and God are, you know, sometimes I pray that prayer, God, are we all good? Sometimes you just need, okay, you and, you and God all good. Then get up, make your way to one of the tables. We do have a gluten-free table over here. I know that's, that's an issue for a lot of folks, and this will help, uh, help in, in knowing where that is. If, uh, if you'd rather be served at your seat, then uh, we have deacons at the back. Once people start moving and clearing out a little bit, if you'd like to be served where you are for any reason at all, just raise your hand. Uh, they'll be watching for you, and they'll, they'll bring the trays to you uh, to uh, make that as easy as possible uh, for you. Um, 
I want to pray for us and then we will, with grateful hearts, celebrate the amazing grace of God through uh, the Lord's Supper of Servants. Let me pray for us. Father, I pray that you would work in us today, that you would align our hearts with your heart. I pray for those who have, who have never taken that step to give their lives to Jesus, that today would be that day. I pray, I pray for all of us that may have already given our lives to Jesus, that today would be a day in which we, we will look deep in, in us and we listen for your voice and we make things right. I pray that our lives would not be wasted, that you bring people to mind who need to know you, that, that we learn to be generous like you're generous, givers like you're giver. Lord, work in us today to your glory and uh, thank you for Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.